Hello, and welcome to the History and Genealogy Department's presentation of SLCL databases for genealogy research. The objectives for the program are to introduce you to the most popular St. Louis County Library genealogy databases, to show you how to access them, to show you how to use them, how to search them, and to show you some examples of what might be found. Keep in mind that these are highlights and this list is not all inclusive. Here is a list of the databases that we'll be discussing today. Everything from general uh, genealogy databases like Ancestry Library Edition and Heritage Quest to more specific ones that have military records like Fold3, newspaper articles like newspapers.com, or land records like History Geo. We'll also be finishing up with FamilySearch.org, which is not a database that the library subscribes to, but the library is an affiliate library, and we'll talk about what that means. So how are we going to access these databases? We're going to want to go to the library's website at slcl.org. We're going to click on Research and Learn then on History and Genealogy, and then on Online Research. It'll take us to a list of resources A to Z, where we see all of the history and genealogy databases, as well as some commonly used website links. We're gonna use this first one here as an example, the AAS Historical Periodicals Collection. We would click on the title, then it would take us to some more information about the resource. Then we would click on go to resource. If we were accessing this database from home, we would enter our library card number and PIN. And then we would be taken to the resource and we could start searching. So the first database that we're gonna take a look at today is Ancestry Library Edition. So Ancestry Library Edition is great to use for general research. It's great for beginning research. It is the largest database of records searchable by name. It is similar to the Ancestry.com that you would have to have a subscription uh, for and to pay for. And you can use it in any of the library's branches. This is the main page for Ancestry Library Edition. They offer this quick start box. I don't tend to use this very often. I think it's a little confusing. I usually like to start with records and in particular census records. So I like to go to the search tab and then I like to go to census and voter lists since censuses are really the backbone of genealogy research in the US. They are taken every 10 years, so you can easily trace a family back. So if we click on census and voter lists, we're taken to a search page for that. We can narrow this down a little bit more just to US censuses. And then we're taken to the US search page. So we're gonna search for an individual by the name of Edgar Snipes. So we're gonna put in his first name and last name, approximate year of birth, and we're gonna start typing in the location where we think he may have been living. And then we do wanna choose from the options that they give us, that'll make the search more accurate. Keep in mind that we're not filling in all of these boxes. We have a lot of boxes here, but we don't necessarily wanna fill them all in. We wanna kind of take a less is more approach. If this was a very common name, we might wanna fill a couple more of them in but we don't wanna filter out too many of the results. So we're gonna go ahead and search on these three key pieces of information. It looks like this first one might be him, Edgar Snipes, born in Mississippi in 1940. He's living in Granite City, Illinois. So if we click on this record here, it takes us to the detail page. So what we have are the details from the record down the center. This is sort of a transcription of what's on the record. And then we have the actual record here out to the left-hand side. If we click on that, 
we are taken to the actual record. Ancestry does a great job of highlighting the family for you. So if we zoom in on this, we see Edgar Snipes and his wife and his children living in Granite City in 1940. So if we go back to the detail page and we scroll down a little bit, we see this list of suggested records. Ancestry is getting really good about figuring out who you're looking for or who your person is. And they will give you suggested records, records that Ancestry thinks are your person. Now, sometimes these are correct and you, sometimes you might not get any if it can't figure it out, if Ancestry can't figure it out. Um, but this can be a time saver so you don't have to go individually looking for these records. Also, if we scroll down a little more, Another nice thing is we see the list of all of the people who are in the household. And if we click on one of the other members, so say his wife, Tressa Snipes, she's um, a blue link. So we can click on her and then it will actually take us to her details from the census, her suggested records, and then we can research her that way. Another thing that we can do on Ancestry is we can use this search tab, but instead of going to, say, census records, we can go to all categories. What it'll do is it'll take us to a page where you can find this map along with a list of states and also different continents where you can do different countries. And you can see just what records they have on that particular place. And sometimes it's nice if you know your ancestors are from a particular area to kind of narrow down your search a little bit. So say we had ancestors who were living in Ohio, we could click Ohio and then it would show us here only record sets that deal with Ohio. And we could choose one of those and just search just in that. We can also, of course, do this for other countries. So if we wanted to see the records that they have for Germany, we could do that. One more thing I'd like to show you on Ancestry Library Edition, if we scroll down to the bottom, we see some quick links and the first one is public member trees. So public member trees are going to be trees that people who have Ancestry.com accounts or Ancestry.com free accounts, and if they've built a tree and made it public, you can search it. This is good if you're kind of at a brick wall, you don't really know where to go next, you kind of need some ideas. There may be someone else out there who perhaps you're distantly related to, who maybe they've done more research on this family, or maybe they know something about the family that you don't. So you always want to take it with a grain of salt. It's just someone else's work. But I do think that sometimes these are worth looking at. So if we click there, um, we get to a search page that looks similar. But again, instead of searching for records, we're searching for people in these trees. And eventually you would see something like this. You would see someone else's tree where they have um, the people and you can click on them and see what records they have attached and so on. All right, the next database we're gonna talk about is Heritage Quest Online. So Heritage Quest Online is great for general research. It's great for beginning research. I like to call it Ancestry Light because it is owned by Ancestry. It looks like Ancestry. They just have uh, fewer records. So it's more of a, a selection of records from Ancestry's um, from the larger site. But what's nice is you can use it from home. So this is what the Heritage Quest main page looks like. If we scroll down, you can see the different types of records that they have, everything from census records to some wills to some immigration records. Keep in mind that these are not going to be full sets of records. So they might have wills, but they may only have them for certain states. If we scroll down, we see some other records. One thing that I do like about this is that they have the Social Security Death Index. So for those of you who are looking for a death uh, records for more uh, recent ancestors where you can't get a death certificate, you may be able to find a death date for them in the Social Security Death Index. So if we scroll all the way down, we also see that they do have some select records in some foreign countries as well. So if we go up to the top, let's just use census as an example again. We can search the census or we can choose a specific year. 
And again, our search page looks a lot like Ancestry, so we would approach it the same way. The next database that we'll talk about is MyHeritage Library Edition. So MyHeritage is good for general research. It's good for beginning research. You can use it from home. This is what the main page looks like. So we're going to do an example search on a Carl Gran born around 1918 in St. Louis. And so let's see what we get for that. So we have some results here. It looks like the first one and maybe the fourth one are him. Take a look at this first result here. You'll see that it says Carl Arthur Gran, and you'll see below that it says family search family tree. So my heritage does a good job of pulling from different databases and sort of, um, you know, listing all of those results on its site. So in this case, if we click here, what we're actually seeing are the details on Carl Gran from his section of the familysearch.org family tree. Um, we have a birth date, we have some residence information, we have a death date, we have some family members. If we scroll down, we also see some things attached or some related records, um, including this right here, which looks to be a census. So if we click on it, it is the 1920 census. If we zoom in on this portion here, we do see a Carl Gran is the son of August Gran and Wilhelmina Gran living in St. Louis in 1920. The next database we're going to look at is Fold3. Fold3 is great to use for military research, but they also have some non-military records and Fold3 can be used from home. Fold3's main page looks like this. We're gonna do a sample search for a military record just by using this main search box because we can filter the results later. So in this case, we're gonna look for a William Sherman and we get a lot of results for William Sherman, but we can filter on the side. So we can choose Civil War and we can add a place. So in this case, we're gonna choose Missouri. And now we have fewer results. And um, I think this might be him here. So let's click on this record. And what we see is the compiled service record for William Sherman. And I use this as an example because it's so rare that we find photographs or physical descriptions of our ancestors. We feel very, very lucky when we do. Oftentimes you will find physical descriptions in records of soldiers. So in this case, we do see, if we zoom in here, that um, William had gray eyes, light hair, a fair complexion, and he was five feet, nine inches tall. So that's kind of a neat find. All right, another thing that is on Fold3 that I use quite often are the city directories. And you can get to the city directories on Fold3 by clicking on the Browse tab. Only instead of filtering over here for a conflict, like we did for the military record, we're gonna scroll down until we see non-military. So we can either choose non-military from the title collection or from the publication type. And that one, then what we're gonna see here are just non-military records. If we scroll down, we start to see city directories, including city directories for St. Louis. So if we take a look as an example in the 1863 directory, we see all of these pages and what Fold3 will do is they will put the name at the top of the page in blue underneath the page. So you'll know which page to go to to find your person. And I sometimes like to browse city directories, especially if I'm dealing with a surname that could be misspelled. And Fold3 is a nice place to do that. So if we click on this page, we do see um, that top person there is Peter Casey. He owned a saloon at 245 Broadway. The next database is newspapers.com. 
Newspapers.com is great for general newspaper research. So if you're looking for anything in a newspaper from an article or a story to a marriage um, announcement or an obituary, newspapers.com is where you want to go and you can use it from home. So this is what the main page for newspapers.com looks like. We're going to initiate a search from the main search box on this one as well, because you have the opportunity to do a lot of filtering here. So we're going to search for a Foscolo Hendrick. Um, he was alive. This is kind of a big window here, but we'll do 1890 to 1940. He would have been an adult. And he was living either in New, Jer New Jersey or New York or possibly both of those states at different times. So we'll see what we get from this search. So we do have several results. And this first one here is from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. And unfortunately, Mr. Foscolo Hendrick did um, have to declare bankruptcy. But that's the neat thing about newspapers is you really never know what you're going to find about your ancestors. So another thing we can do on newspapers.com is we can look in a particular paper. So we can click on papers and then we can start typing in the name of a paper. So in this case, we'll do St. Louis Globe Democrat. And here it comes up here. So now we're taken to a page where we're just searching in the Globe Democrat. So let's for, search for an individual by the name of William McDonough. And there we go. And we see several results for him. One more thing that we can do on newspapers.com is we can browse for different papers. This is if you know the city where your ancestor lived and you want to search in a specific paper, um, maybe you don't know the name, you want to see all the papers that they do have, you would want to use this. Or say your person lived in a smaller town and you don't know if that town had a paper. So you'd want to use the browse feature. So you'll click on browse and then you can filter out here. So we'll use Memphis, Tennessee as an example. So United States, Tennessee, Memphis, and then we can see what papers they have. And if we want to search in the public ledger, we can choose a year and then we can search just in that paper. All right. The next database is newspaper archive. Newspaper Archive is great for smaller town newspaper research, not exclusively, but they do tend to be a good database for that. You do have to be in the history and genealogy department in order to use this database. So the main page looks like this. I like to go to the advanced search so I can put in just a little bit more information. In this case, I'm going to search for a Melvin Crumrine who was living in Topeka, Kansas. So we do get six results. And if we just take this first one as an example, we see that Melvin Crumrine looks like was applying for a building permit. So we know he must have been building either a home or a business or something. If we want to see what papers Newspaper Archive has, same thing as with newspapers.com. We can click on Browse by Location, and then we can say we wanted to see what papers they had for Hartford, Connecticut. We could do U.S., Connecticut, Hartford, all newspapers, and then we can browse just within that paper if we want, um, which is nice. Historical St. Louis Post-Dispatch is next. The historical St. Louis Post-Dispatch is great for those of you who are doing St. Louis research and you need access to the Post-Dispatch that is a little bit more recent. The Post-Dispatch is in newspapers.com, but due to copyright, it is only available up until 1922. So there isn't anything from the Post-Dispatch post-1922 on newspapers.com. So if you want something more recent for the post, I would suggest using historical post-dispatch and you can use it from home. So this is what the main page looks like. Again, I like to go to the advanced search 
And in this case, I'm going to be looking for articles on the St. Louis Steamers soccer team that were in St. Louis. Now, I'm kind of using this as an example to, to show you some search tricks. So I'm going to put St. Louis Steamers and I'm going to search on that. But what I get, the results I get are not what I'm wanting. I'm getting a lot of results about steamboats coming into St. Louis in the early 1900s. So I need to do something to better filter these results. So I can do a couple of things. One, I can change the publication date. So in this case, this is what I did here. And I applied 1980 to 1989 for the date so that I would get articles on the soccer team. But what I could also do, and you can do this with most newspaper search sites, is I could have put St. Louis steamers in quotation marks. And then it would give me results only for those three words right next to each other. But for this example, we'll go ahead and choose this one right here. It is an article from 1981. And if we click on it, we see that it definitely deals with the St. Louis steamers. If we scroll down, we see an article about giveaways. We see player profiles. We see the schedule. We see a half price offer. So that is what we were wanting. We can also, in, in the historical post-dispatch or in any of these newspaper sites, we can just browse a, a day of the paper. Sometimes the technology that picks up our keywords in these papers doesn't always work great. Right. It's OCR or optical character recognition, and if the paper is blurry or it's smudged, it might not pick up the words that you're looking for. So if you know something happened on a certain date, or if you're looking for a particular obituary for someone who you know their death date, I would suggest browsing. So in this case, we can go to publication date and we can choose on this date. And then since we're talking about more recent papers, let's do May 9th of 1997. And then our results are gonna be all different pages of that May 9th paper. So we can just pick the first one and it takes us to the paper page three, but we can of course change this to page one and then we can browse through the whole paper if we want to. The next database we're gonna take a look at is Heritage Hub. Heritage Hub is great for more recent obituaries. Again, not exclusively, but it tends to focus on that and you can use it from home. So Heritage Hub looks like this. We do go ahead and start searching from this main page. So we're gonna search for an Elizabeth Gron. We see uh, 14 results, but this first one looks to be her, Elizabeth Teresa Gron, and this is in the paper um, October of 2013. If we click on it, we see the obituary here, but you'll notice that it is text only. So Heritage Hub does not show you the actual page of the paper. It just shows you a text version of the obituary. If you wanna see what sources are included and what papers are included in Heritage Hub, you can click on this A to Z source list and you'll see all the papers. And one thing I wanna show you is um, as far as the dates. So you'll see that the St. Louis Post-Dispatch is in here, but it is 1988 to current. And if you look on this page, you'll see most of them, I think actually all of them with the exception of just one are more recent obituaries. The next database that we're gonna talk about is History Geo. So History Geo is great for first landowner records. So these would be records for someone who was the first person to obtain land from the government. And you can use this database from home. So when you go to the main page, you're going to want to click on First Landowner's Project. And then what we see is a map of the US and then some search boxes at the top. So in this case, we're gonna search for a surname of Welker in Perry County, Missouri. So what's gonna happen when we search on those parameters is we'll zoom in a little bit and we'll see a yellow dot. So if we click on this yellow dot, 
Then we're going to see zoomed in a little bit more and we're going to see some more green dots. So again, we're zooming in on the map here. And if we click on one of those, we'll zoom in some more and then we'll see individual people and their plats of land. So in this case, let's take a look at John Welker right here. So we're going to click on that figure and it's going to give us a pop-up box that gives us information on his parcel, the date, um, the township and range and section. And then if we click here where it says view BLM document, BLM is Bureau of Land Management. We can click there and it will show us the actual document. Now, this is neat to see for those of you whose ancestors do have this land. You can see exactly where it was. Um, but another nice thing about this, this database is for those of you who are doing cluster research, where you have to kind of base some of your genealogy on the family's movement and who they were living around, this is a great tool for that. The next database is Fire Insurance Maps Online, also called FIMO. You'll also hear these referred to as Sanborn Maps. These are great for home or building research, and you can use this from home. So this is what the main page looks like. We're going to want to click on the interactive map. So it's going to take us to a another search box. But before we go there, this is the sample that we're going to use, the example that we're going to use, which is the Charles G. Stiefel's Brewery located at North 14th and Howard Streets. It was around during the mid to late 1800s. So we're going to see if we can find it on a uh, fire insurance map. Okay, so we are taken to this search page. You'll notice that it has Missouri and Illinois highlighted. This version of the fire insurance maps actually only includes the St. Louis area. Um, these are, you can find these maps for other cities, but they're not going to be included in this uh, database that we have here at the library. So we're gonna search for Howard and 14th Street. So we can either put in cross streets or we can put it in address. And what it's going to do on the next page is it's going to drop a pin on a modern map of St. Louis to show us where our brewery was. So then what we're going to do is we're going to pick a map down here. So let's choose the 1888 map and we're going to click on show. And what that's going to do is it's going to overlay the modern map with the pages or the sections of the fire insurance map. So you want to pay attention to what number your uh, pin is in. And in this case, it looks like it's in 116. So now we're going to actually click on the name of the map which is Insurance Maps of St. Louis, Volume 2, revised to August 1888. So we're going to click on that. And it's going to take us to the actual pages of the map. So we're going to need to click on 116. In this case, there's actually a 116 left and a 116 right. So you kind of have to figure out which one you need. Um, we want left. So we're going to click here. So this is what the page of the map looks like. And then if we scroll in, we see that this is our building. So we can see where the malt house was, where the beer storage was, where the wash house was. We see that they had a night watchman on duty. So these were actually used by the fire departments, but what we can use them for now for research as we can see what the, the building or the business or the structure looked like. We can know what it was made out of because this is color coded. We can see if the building was expanded or the home was expanded over the years. So these are um, this is a neat database and a neat resource to take a look at. The next database is Find My Past. So Find My Past is good for general research, but it has sort of a specialty for British Isles research, and you can use it in any branch. So this is what Find My Past looks like. I usually go to the bottom and I search on search family records here. And then it takes me to the search page. I'm going to want to do some filtering over on the left-hand side. So in this case, our example is going to be United Kingdom. 
And we're gonna look at census records in the United Kingdom. So we're gonna look for a Michael Parkinson, who we think was born around 1810 and might have been living in Leeds, England. So it's gonna give us four results. And these first two look like they might be him, Michael Parkinson in 1851 and 1861 censuses. And if we click on that first one, we do see the actual census there. And if we zoom in, we do see Michael Parkinson, his wife, Anne, and their children. And he was a weaver. We even get his address as well. So the next database is American Ancestors. American Ancestors is great for early American research and New England research. Now, again, not exclusively, but it does tend to have a concentration in those areas. You do have to be in the history and genealogy department in order to use this database. So let's take a look at the search tab. We can click there. And if we want to just to search all databases, let's use Dorothy Pike as an example. We're going to take it way back. She was living in the mid 1600s, um, possibly in Massachusetts. So if we search on that information, we do see um, eight results here. And this first one is a Dorothy Pike. It looks like it's going to give us some information about a marriage. So let's click on view image. And it does take us to a page from a book, which is Tory's New England Marriages. And if we zoom in here, we do see a reference to a marriage between a Daniel Hendrick and first wife, Dorothy Pike, 1645, Haverhill, Massachusetts. We also see some other citation information there. And it definitely leads us in a direction to go as far as finding more records in the Haverhill area. Now, same thing with the other sites. If we want to see what publications are actually included here, we can click on publications and we see a list of all of the uh, record sets that they have. You can see that it is definitely not exclusively New England. We have some Alabama there. And if we scroll down on this page, we see Connecticut and Massachusetts and Maine, but then we also see Costa Rica records. And we see Denmark records. So again, none of these are, you know, exclusively just one thing. All right. The last item that we're going to talk about is FamilySearch.org. So FamilySearch.org is great for general genealogy research. It's great for beginning research. And it's great for specific locality records. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. It is not a St. Louis County Library database. You do make your own account. We do have a link to it on our um, resources A to Z page, though. FamilySearch.org um, contains the digitized records of the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, Utah. Now, SLCL is a Family Search affiliate library, and we'll talk about that momentarily as well. So this is what the main page looks like for Family Search. You can do just a general search if you want to. We could click on search here and records, and then we could search for a person here. So our example will be Lucy Childs, who was born around 1850 in New Jersey. And if we click search, we see some results. The first one and actually the fourth one look like they might be her. Let's take a look at this record right here. It's an 1850 census. And what we go to is a page that looks a lot like the uh, Ancestry Library Edition results page, where we see details down the center. We see similar records or suggested records on the right-hand side. And then we have the original document on the left that we always want to take a look at. So here it is here. And if we zoom in, we do see Lucy Ann Childs as just a one-year-old living with her, her parents, William and Elizabeth, in New Jersey. 
But another thing that we can use Family Search for is we can go into specific localities. Not everything in Family Search is indexed and searchable by name. So we definitely want to keep this type of search in our back pocket. So we can go to the search tab, but then we want to go to catalog. And if we click on catalog, we'll be taken to this search page. And the first thing that I would suggest doing here is I would go ahead and change this from any availability to online, because that way we're just searching in the digitized records that are on familysearch.org. If we leave it as any, it will give us everything in the whole family search catalog. And if you're not planning on um, making a research trip to Salt Lake City anytime soon, um, you might want to just keep it on as online because it will give you books and other things that might only be out there. So the default search here is a place search. And just like with Ancestry, you do want to start typing the place keeping in mind that many, many genealogy records are kept at the county level. So that's always a good place to start. So for this example, we're gonna start typing in Johnston County, North Carolina, and then we're gonna choose that when it pops up. And then we'll be taken to a list of all the records that Family Search has for Johnston County, North Carolina. So say we're looking for vital records, we could click here and it will show us the five vital records that they have digitized. And let's say we were looking for marriage licenses for 1894 to 1966. If we click there on the blue and then we scroll down, we see marriage licenses for several years. And then over on the side, we see two symbols. We see a camera and we see a magnifying glass. So the camera means that these are digitized. And if you click on the camera, you can view them. The magnifying glass means that at least some of this has been indexed and is searchable by name. So if you click on the magnifying glass, it will let you search by name. But let's see what the records look like when we click on the camera. Here they are, the marriage licenses that they have digitized um, probably from microfilm. And if we click on one of them, just as an example, we see a um, civil marriage record for Johnston County. If we zoom in a little bit, we see that there is a Lewis Badger who is marrying an Aurelia Bridges. And I like these civil records because they give more information than some in that they are listing the parents. So that's how we would find those. One more note about the symbols. So again, if you see the camera, it means that you can view those records. If you're looking at, you know, if you're accessing the database from home, you click on the camera, they'll be right there for you to view. If you see a camera, but it has a key above it, it means those records might be locked to certain levels. So if you click on that camera with the key, it will give you a message. And it will either say, these records are only available in a family search affiliate library. And that would be us. So you could come into any St. Louis County Library branch and you'd be able to view those records. It will recognize where you're trying to access them from. Sometimes though, when you click on that, it will give you a message that says it's available in a family history center or FHC only. There are a few family history centers in the St. Louis area where you could go and view those. There is also a map that you can access from the Family Search homepage that shows you where all the family history centers are located. So just keep that in mind for those two um, icons. In conclusion, there are a variety of data databases available through the St. Louis County Library. Many of them um, can be used from home. Some are in library use only, and a few are history and genealogy department use only. So pay attention to that. Some of the databases are general, some are a little more specialized. And you'll notice that some records are available on multiple databases. You can find census records on a lot of the databases that were discussed today. So it just kind of depends on, depends on you know, which database, which, um, which searching, which, uh, you know, one you like better. 
which sort of interface you like better. And I wish you all good luck and have fun with your searching. Remember, genealogy is a hobby, so it should be fun. And thank you all for watching.